This week in a WealthTrack exclusive, 50 years of market and investment perspective from great investor Hirsch Cohen is next on Consuelo Mack WealthTrack. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective. Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences. Rosalind P. Walter and the Fairholme Foundation. Hello and welcome to this edition of WealthTrack. I'm Consuelo Mack. Investing is complicated. There are so many choices available and so many decisions to make, it can be absolutely overwhelming. Sometimes a simple approach is the best one. One tried and true strategy over the years has been to invest in companies that increase their dividends every year and reinvest those dividends back into the company's stocks, letting the power of compounding go to work. Now, historically, it's been a performance winner. An analysis by Ned Davis Research of Russell 3000 companies over the last 30 years found that investing in dividend growers has done substantially better than in dividend paying companies that don't grow their dividends and significantly outpace stocks of non-dividend paying companies. The stocks of the dividend growers were also less volatile than the dividend non-changers and non-payers. These results are no surprise to this week's guest, who has spent a half a century finding high-quality dividend growers and has beaten the S&P over the years doing it. He is great investor Hirsch Cohen, co-chief investment officer of Clearbridge Investments, a Leg Mason affiliate, where he oversees nearly $18 billion in assets. He is also co-manager of the firm's dividend strategy portfolios, including the Clearbridge Dividend Strategy Fund, which he has co-managed since 2009. Cohen made his reputation with the Clearbridge Appreciation Fund, which he left in 2010 after a 30-year run, in which he edged out the S&P 500 with much less risk and volatility than the market. Cohen is stepping down from management of the fund at the end of 2017, but will continue to run portfolios for clients. He will also stay on as co-chief investment officer with Scott Glasser. I began the interview by asking Cohen why dividends have always played a key role in his investment strategy. Because I think, A, they provide some, some measure of downside protection. When markets go down, there is some point at which people will say, the yield on this stock is enough that I'll, I'd rather own this than money funds or bonds or something. Okay, that, that went out of favor in the 1990s, but it came back into favor of the, over the past decade. Right. Um, it, it, great companies can give you a rising stream of income, and, and especially in this environment. Now, my love of dividends goes way back, but in this environment, who's getting raises of five, six, seven, eight, twelve percent a couple of years ago? You know, the, so. That, con that rising stream of income is terrific. The power of compounding, people forget about. They don't understand, they don't think about it. And it makes for, it, it just makes for a better future. If you start when you're young mm -hmm. and let the markets work, let the great companies work, work for you and, and take that money and either reinvest it. I mean, the best part is reinvesting it and then somewhere down the road in the future, um, stop reinvesting it and, and, and get the dividends directly and, and use them for whatever, for whatever, right. living expenses, charities, get whatever it is. And, and uh, it's, it, just, it just makes, I, I just think they, it makes for a, uh, um, a kind of a better life to be thinking about rising streams of income. And, and it's important, so, so the rising streams of income, and again, long before there was anything called the dividend aristocrats list, right. Right. You um, at right. you know the Clearbridge and, and predecessor firms yeah, right. were were basically looking at companies that that were growing their dividends. You weren't looking for necessarily high yield companies. You were looking for growing dividend uh, streams uh, uh, consistently over time. I've owned so, companies like Johnson and Johnson, 3M, to name a couple that that their dividends have gone up every year for right. you know 50 years or so. I don't don't quote me on the exact number, but you know. It, you know Decades, many, many decades. Mm -hmm. 
um, industrial, PPG, an industrial company. These are, it's, it's, always, it's always a nice thing to see that announcement every year of those dividends going up. So in and I like to look for, we like, my team and I like to look for companies that could be the dividend aristocrats of the future. Mm -hmm. So Microsoft, for example, was a, uh, a stock that was, had, had never, a tech, a technology in general. Right. Had, had kind Didn't of was, pay dividends. It was anathema to them to pay dividends. Right. And so, but when you, um, when they became more mature and started to uh, have all this excess cash and pressure from shareholders within the past decade to pay dividends and raise dividends, and, and uh, so they, they don't qualify as having paid 25 years of consecutive growth, but they might in the future, mm -hmm. and, it's, and, and meanwhile, they, you know, Texas Instruments, Micro, they become very good dividend growers. How do you make that decision to stick with a company? Let's say one of the companies that has a history of growing dividends um, you know, when it's appreciated a lot or when it's declined a lot or, I mean, how do you make, how do you make those decisions? Gee, those are such easy questions. Bull markets and bear markets. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an art. It's not a science. Yeah. So I, and, um, but my, our tendency is to let companies kind of leave companies alone and mm -hmm. let them do the thing for you. Hold them. If you, uh, you, you would ask me to think about investing principles for right. people and you know in our pre-interview and I, I'll tell you one of my principles is traders I, I, you don't meet too many rich traders but you do meet very well-to-do long-term investors and so if you get shaken out every time there's a 10% down move in in one of these great companies you'll, you'll never get the, the power of the compound you'll never get the full benefits you just you, uh, who can time it that well mm -hmm. so but the, the answer to your question is if as long as a company is, is making the right kinds of decisions in terms of capital allocation, that is, you know, how much they put into research and development, how much they put into uh, pay out in dividends, uh, how much they might do stop, stock buyback. I mean, as long as the company's doing the right thing in terms of capital allocation, as long as their business model is good, uh, you have to pay attention to outside forces. I mean, one of the mistakes I made was not understanding probably Probably the worst stock I've had in the last uh, in the last decade was Gannett. I didn't understand how quickly mm -hmm. newspaper readership was going down. Why? I like to read the newspapers, you know. I like a, right. but you I didn't Warren realize Buffett, how quickly I didn't right. re realize how quickly individuals were giving up. Young people were not reading the newspaper, and so you have to pay attention. So, right. um, and they they cut their dividend. And to me, a dividend cut is that's a scene. You basically want to get out of a stock if it's a dividend cut, but that fortunately doesn't doesn't happen very often. I I don't, I don't want to see great management straying too far from what they do. When companies start making mega mergers that you're kind of scratching your head, why are they doing that? that that's a pretty good time to examine, uh, examine your, your underlying belief in a stock. You know, that doesn't happen all the time. Look, tuck in acquisitions, we, you know, we, we like those for companies as long as they fit. Right. There are, you know, there are just signs you kind of look for over the years. You get signed uh -huh. one. As I say, one is just getting outside their field of expertise. Right. I mean, you know, I think Microsoft did that many years ago. They bought, they bought um, Skype, they bought um, uh, Nokia, and I'm like, well, what the heck are they mm -hmm. doing? You know. So when they when they do something like that, is yeah. that that, that you that's that's a signal that's a signal, that's a signal to... you wanna you wanna yell at management and right. uh, you know and hope they do something about it, which in that case they did. Right. So the capital allocation piece, which you had just mentioned, yeah. would you equate a stock buyback with a dividend? I do not equate payment? them. No, I we much prefer dividends. Dividends yes. you have in hand. It's a real, uh, you know, it's real money. It's spendable right. money. Companies are loath to stop paying them or to cut them. Stock buybacks, unless it's a Dutch tender offer or a tender offer for stock, you, you don't know for sure that the companies are actually going to execute them. And a lot of the buybacks are done at, 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 when the stocks are way too expensive anyhow. When do I like buybacks? When the markets are getting killed and stocks are, are uh, selling at, at below, below fair value. Mm -hmm. Then you want buybacks, sure. One of your long-term holdings has been Berkshire Hathaway, yeah. which doesn't pay no, a dividend. Right. But you've talked about the the power of compounding. Well, and that's there's no better an, an compounder example. and no exactly. better capital allocator. And so, so the, that, in my opinion, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> it, that fits in because of again management decisions of what they're doing with yeah, their capital. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's rare that you'll get that kind of of company with such incredibly good compounding abilities. Uh, that doesn't pay a dividend. I interview, I've interviewed you many times over the years, and, and you came to help us on WealthTrack understand what was going on during the, uh, you know, the Great Recession. So I looked back at some of our 
show is one of the ones that you did in 2008. And at that time, in the midst of this panic, your one investment recommendation was to buy a basket of high quality dividend paying stocks. We'll put it on, on, the, on WealthTrack again, the, the list of companies that you have that have been long term dividend payers. Well, how did you, you know, how did you keep your cool and yeah. make yeah. a rational decision like that? Which yeah. Paid off yeah. big time. Well, I don't. I don't know if I kept my. I don't know if I kept my cool because right. inside, yeah. I mean, I gained weight. Inside, it's turmoil. But here's the thing, and I urge people to study market stock market history. And so, um, and and I love the markets. And so I know that in 1929 to 1932, if you look at graphs of the market, it had a certain pattern. The market had a decline, 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 waterfall, panic, rally back down to, the, to uh, a level that it, that it found a bottom at. And the leading stocks, the leading stock, the stocks that the RCAs of the world, the, high, the things, the new, the new things in the, mm -hmm. in the world, went down 80 to 90 percent. Okay, that was number one. Number two, 1970, not, well, 1973, 74, you had a similar situation. The so-called nifty, nifty 50, 50 stocks, which mm -hmm. people would pay any price for, they went down 80 or 90 percent, and the market had the waterfall decline in October of 74. Look at the state that the country was in then. I mean, you know, who could, who could think about stocks? But you had the same pattern, waterfall decline in, in, in the summer, rally, decline back to the levels in December, and bing, that was it. And the same thing happened in 2000 to 2002. The internet stocks, the, tech, the, the ones that had so-called new metrics of, of, uh, of measurement, <laughs> bam, 90%. And down nine, and the same thing. Waterfall decline, rally. It took a little longer because the level of speculation had been so great. Guess, guess what? 2007, 2008, same thing. Waterfall decline, and so, and and um, and the world feels like it's coming to an end. People get scared. They're phys I said, uh, you're physically sick. The difference is, I recognized that that when you feel that way, mm -hmm. you're probably better off buying stocks than selling them. What, what's, what's hard, I think, for m most individuals, number one, is, is maybe they ride down the first leg and then they, yeah. they, you know, and then they yeah. think then there's that little dip up. Yeah. But then it's the, it's the second leg that just, that's the washout leg, that's the capitulation right. leg. But in the meantime, you know, you've lost paper money, you, you know, on the way down. How, well, how, hopefully, but, and, hopefully you've done something to protect yourself well, against the most speculative items right. so in that's the beginning. The that goes back to your question, how do you know when to sell? I mean, right. there's no formula. There's no formula. Sometimes things are just crazy. One of the char key characteristics that, that you are you know, applauded for is, is that, that your performance in down markets is so much better than the market, and that basically you are able to protect your shareholders on in down markets. How did you do that? And what I think is important is what Morningstar said years ago. Certain funds help people stay in the market. I believe in trying to keep the volatility lower than the general market. So if I can give market or maybe market beating returns over a cycle, but with 75 or 80 percent of the volatility, maybe people will stay aboard and, and you go back to, to 1974, we talked about this, I use this in speeches all the time to people about, you know, you think back to 1974, the world was, felt like it was coming to mm -hmm. an end. You know, the country was torn apart by the war, the president and vice president resigned in disgrace, uh, New York City was effectively bankrupt, oil mm -hmm. prices were tripling, inflation was, you couldn't get gasoline, the, the, the country was a mess. It was a mess. And I'll ask people, where do you think the Dow Jones average was? And if they don't know, they'll say, oh, 5,000, 6,000. No, 600. And look where, we, look where we've come. Right. Look how Pretty far we've come mm -hmm. since then. And it hasn't been easy. And look at all the things that have happened. Now the Dow is, what, 22,000, mm -hmm. something like that. I mean, so, and, and plus dividends along the way. And so, and there's some pretty scary things have happened along 20% interest rates, the world, uh, 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 the World Trade Center, mm -hmm. um, emerging markets collapsing, et cetera, et cetera. You know, a, a ten-year you know, war in endless. Iraq. I mean, so huh? right. And and here we are at all-time highs. Why? Because this country's resilient. Corporate America does a great job. So I love great. I love great companies. I love dividend-paying right. companies. I try to stay out of the way of uh, one of my greatest strengths is also one of my greatest weaknesses. I don't like paying up for stocks, and so. In markets that are extended bull markets, like I'll now. say now, like now, I'll miss, I'll miss some stocks, or mm -hmm. I'll sell them too early. I know I sold Microsoft and Intel way too early in 1998, 
because um, we had bought them at eight and 12 times earnings. I sold them at 30 times earnings on the way to 50 times earnings. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I felt stupid, but you know, it kind of comes back, worked out, at, for Scott and me, it worked out well in 2000 yes. to 2003. You just have, I mean, it's, there's so no, protecting. So, but so as an active manager, right. what I want to do is keep people on the train. And, and, and by the way, and if I can't do better than passive funds in a down market, then I shouldn't be managing money. When you look at the active versus passive debate, I mean, I, I just, you know, I realize that if you are in, in an index fund, when the index fund declines, you are going to, you are going to feel the full brunt of the market decline. We haven't really seen a market decline, we, a significant one, you know, in eight and a half years. Exactly. And, exactly. And, and it's during this period of time when index funds have absolutely taken off. And yes, and it's... And, and, more, it's, and it's, so I, I, you know, it's feeling like... And it's easy for people to get in, but play. I don't want to see people trading the market. I, I tell you, as I said, I go back to what I said before. I don't think you get rich trading and, cha mm -hmm. and what you wind up doing is missing the, missing the big moves, it's, you, you don't make money that way. And no, so, as an individual, uh, and, and as so an active ETFs manager, make it too don't. easy to get in. You get in and out during the day. Now, you know, the we have ETFs, we've started some. I mean, I don't know, are they good, are they not good? I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll use them for specialty things. Everybody, mm -hmm. everybody can have a use for them. But, you know, I like picking, picking great companies. That, that's, what we, that's one of the things that we try to do. So the argument that, that the market is so efficient now because yeah. there are so many yeah. smart people who, on Wall Street and 99% of the trading is driven by machines that have all of this you know, metadata in it and they're you know, picking up every possible <laughs> <laughs> you know, tidbit about every single company that you're investing in. So how can you possibly do better than the average? Uh, so that's the argument. What, mm. what's, what's your... Response, because what happens is because what happens there aren't that many of those companies and so what happens is it tends to get concentrated in those mm -hmm. and does leave some things that are kind of out of favor that if you're patient enough you'll find them and hold them I mean that's one answer the other answer is um, sometimes you just can't beat it you know sometimes you can't right. and then you won't and we won't know we won't know until the next bear market so we won't know I want people to survive, mm -hmm. and if you survive, you can you can you can do very well. Yeah, and so and, and so as an active manager, yeah. what are you doing to help people survive? What is it that enables your portfolios not to go down as much as the market? That you have yeah. much better risk-adjusted returns. What is it that you're yeah. doing? Yeah, well, I think the dividend underlying dividends do help. I so I, th I, mean, okay. I think dividend div the popularity of dividend funds I think is well justified, and I think that helps. I think. We're willing, I've always been willing to use cash as a tool. We don't have an enormous amount now, but you know, kind of a little more than what I would call frictional cash. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's not a bad way. And if, the, and, and if I felt uh, really nervous about things, then I'd probably, my team would probably go more to cash. Mm -hmm. And that's a dangerous thing for money managers to do because if you're wrong, you lose your job. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you know, I, I've been able to survive that. And so cash has helped. Um, the quality of the companies, I think, makes a big difference. And avoiding, and avoiding the, to me, the biggest thing is avoiding the areas of the, with, with the kind of the, the, the greatest, um, uh, to say the greatest risk is one way of putting it, but the kind of things that have, things that have been sort of in bubble territory before and, are, and, and, and start to break. And, uh, you know, I, I, I can't, I, I'm not going to, won't name those stocks now, and, and, and more money has been lost shorting, quote, bubble stocks as they're on their way up, and, but when they break, they can really break hard, and in bear markets, they go down much more than people think. You mm -hmm. want to be out of the way of those things, and it's, you know, you, it's not always possible, but um, since we don't buy a lot of those in the first place, we don't right. have them in the, in the second place. So One of the things that, that you said when you were on, on, on Wealth Track, the market is determined by three things, earnings, interest rates, and psychology. Correct. So what are those three things telling you now? Well, earnings have picked up. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's but good. again, here's the thing. That's a good thing, except this bull market started when earnings were a disaster. A disaster. You know, and the economy was a disaster. So I'm, I'm going to call that, it's a positive, but it's not the only factor. Mm -hmm. Interest rates. Interest rates. Interest rates, low interest rates, huge positive. You know, for the first, in, in 2009, we had for the first time, 2008, we had for the first time since the mid-1950s, stocks yielding 
more upfront than bonds did. My right. God, there was stuff being thrown out the window and the Fed was keeping rates down. Everyone's, oh, the rates are artificially low. It turns out maybe they're not artificially low. This is where, you know, there's no inflation, uh, no headline inflation. And for most things, there's no, the CPI is, is modest. And so rates are deservedly low. Um, earnings, like, so interest rates are positive and psychology, it's interesting. I, I mean, the worst psychology is when people are manic. We don't have that. The best psychology is when people are depressed. I mean, for buying stocks, we yes. don't have that either. Uh, there's sort of a complacency, so I'll call that a neutral. So on balance, this is a market that is, you know, it's kind of probably where it ought to be, where it ought to be. I can't, I, I, I'm, I, I think under, underpinning this market and why I don't think we have a bear market coming it is because interest rates, that's a pretty good ballast underneath the market. You know, that's why, again, you come back to dividends. I mean, would you rather have you know, really good companies paying three to 4% um, or a 10 year treasury paying 2.1? I mean, that, that, that's uh, now some people would rather have the 10 year treasury to paying mm -hmm. two, but that's a choice people make, but dividends give it some support. So right now on balance earnings and interest rates point to being a market that, that's in pretty good shape. Psychology, neutral. Hirsch, what do we but do? But that doesn't mean we're launching a new bull market for him. I mean, it's just no. in support of what's kind of been going on. That, these, are, these are, in fact, things that are in support of the current bull market, which has been a wonderful bull market. Mm -hmm. It's going to correct at some point. Of we course. We just don't know when. Of course. It might have started already. Who Your knows? Your advice to investors when the, the market, which has had this incredible bull run, run does correct. What do we do when that's happening? What do you do? I, I, I've, I mean, I've had stocks I've held since the 1970s. What do I do? I mean, I, I, I pretty much close my eyes. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't, no, I mean, I, I hold. Collecting the dividends. I hold. What do, you know, it, 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 this is just, this, this sounds stupid. I'm sorry. But when the market was collapsing in, in 2009, people would go, ah, I, I say, you know, it's amazing. Not one of our companies cut their dividends today. <laughs> So in other words, the income. If yes, I, I, yes. I try to convince people, don't look, and especially in the dividends, but don't look at what the asset value is. We all like the wealth effect of the market. Listen, when you go home counting your money, that's when you have to be careful. How rich you know, oh, I made so much money, be careful. Mm -hmm. Okay, people aren't doing that now. That, the answer to your question is now. when things turn bad and there's that correction, you don't know how, how low it's gonna go. Unless you've had a mania first, or unless, unless there's been a bubble, you, you, you have to ride it through, you have to stay in the train. And again, that's what a good, what I like to think, a good active manager will help people do. Does that right. mean I'm not gonna go down? Of course not, of course you're gonna go down. The market goes down, you're gonna go down. Hope to go down less, hope to mm -hmm. um, keep people from feeling that they're gonna get, that the bottom's falling out of their lives. It's hard. One of the hardest things for people in the financial business to do in markets is to, is to understand that you know, market markets can fluctuate. I know it's an old stupid saying. Yes, you know, no, but, but they but, do and, and they will. And, and Yeah, I have a quote on my wall and, and uh, from, I think it's from one of the Rockefellers about there's nothing I like better than getting my dividend checks. <laughs> and I, it was one of those daily sayings that popped up on Bloomberg a while ago and, and I printed it out. Printed it out. It's so there. perfect yeah. for you. <laughs> one last question. One investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, what should we all own some of? I, I love, I, I gave, when I was on in 2009, was it, I gave, a, you said one idea. I said, Consuelo, I'm not going to give you one idea, but I'm going to give you a list of 20 yes. dividend payer slash growers. And there have been a couple changes to the list, maybe. We I have know we that have, list. We, I'm uh, guessing it's still a pretty good it, list. It is. So, it is. So and there have been some changes. We've added some things. We've kind of, huh? Yeah. A basket of high quality dividend payers. A basket of high stocks. quality dividend payers. I love it. Why not? We've got the list on our website. Hirsch Cohen, <laughs> so great to see you. Good Thanks swallow. so much. Thank you for having me. At the close of every wealth truck, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's Action Point reiterates Hirsch Cohen's emphasis on the power of compounding dividends and is a core principle of investing that we have discussed many times on WealthTrack. It has put the power of compounding dividends to work for you. Cohen has invested for years in companies that have a long history of paying and growing dividends year after year. Many of them are now called dividend aristocrats, S&P 500 companies that have increased dividends for at least 25 consecutive years. 
Many of them have DRIPs, or dividend reinvestment plans, that automatically reinvest their dividends in new shares. There are also ETFs that invest in companies with long track records of growing dividends every year. Two of the most popular are the Spider S&P Dividend ETF, symbol SDY, and the Vanguard Dividend Appreciation ETF, symbol VIG. The combination of a growing stream of reliable income and the potential of compounding is a powerful force. Well, next week, with passive index funds beating the vast majority of active managers, a few more wealth track guests who have bucked the trend give their views on the stampede to passive. In the meantime, to get Hirsch Cohen's list of dividend growers, go to our website, wealthtrack.com. Also, click on our extra feature where you will hear an additional interview with Cohen about his other passion, 20th century American prince. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective. Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences. Rosalind P. Walter and the Fairholme Foundation.